I am so, so pleased to hear the wonderful music which uh, uh, was today at our worship. What about you guys? Let's give our uh, musicians good applause. They did a wonderful job. So, does our Heavenly Father really love us? This is our second sermon on the epistle, Epistles of John, the book of First John, and so we're going to study chapter 2. When I was growing up as uh, a junior age, maybe even younger, uh, about, I was probably nine years old, we were hanging out with friends uh, at our, uh, just... Uh, on this, you know, at, at our town uh, by the apartment houses, and someone said uh, in the company, we're just having some casual conversation, shooting the breeze, I have a grandma who is praying to God. And we were like, Doing what to what? I mean, grandma, we understood, but praying, we don't know what it was. And to God, we had no idea either. So, the friend who was telling about his grandma said, well, Grandma tells uh, me that God is real. He exists. Oh, we were smart at this time. We knew Santa Claus doesn't exist. We knew uh, the Tooth Fairy doesn't exist. And now we are hearing about someone who sounds uh, to us like Santa Claus or a tooth fairy. And the grandma says he exists. No, we are adult enough. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, what are you really talking about to us? You know. Talk about this to your four-year-old cousin. He will believe you. Uh, and, and again, our friend said, well, well, wait a second. I'm going uh, I'm to call grandma. Uh, she lives on the first floor with the apartment bill. So he goes, knocks on the door, and the old lady uh, with a special scarf, uh, which uh, some people here refer as a babushka, scarf, uh, uh, you know, uh, shows her wrinkled face, uh, and uh, he asks her, Grandma, Grandma, tell them, does God exist? And uh, Grandma uh, makes like a sign of a cross, and she says, oh yeah, Indeed, my uh, boy, grand, uh, God does really exist. And I said, nah, cannot be. So my other friend, uh, his mom, uh, what, he saw his mom on a balcony, and he kind of shouts, mom, mom, answer the question. So the uh, fairly young lady who was his mom uh, probably not yet at 30, uh, looks down from the balcony, Mom, does God exist? And the lady says, 
Of course, no. But uh, uh, why is his grandma uh, thinking that God exists? And uh, the mom, mom was kind of scratching her head a little bit. And then she said, well, uh, God exists in the mind of the elderly people only. Oh, somehow, we don't know how it happened, but our uh, homeroom teacher learned about this discussion, maybe from our friend's mom, and she, uh, and in the class, she said, I know, boys and girls, you were discussing about God. Uh, so... I just want to tell you that all the uh, illiterate, ignorant people believe that there is some kind of God who looks as an old man, show us please the next slide, uh, who lives up on a cloud. But you boys and girls are uh, really, really... Uh, uh, at, uh, old enough to understand. There's nobody who, who lives up on the clouds. And uh, what she had, show us the previous slide, what she had is uh, she showed us the movie. Uh, the, I, 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 this is a screenshot. We already uh, studied about uh, uh, our orbital flights by the cosmonauts. And this is our first uh, uh, hero, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Yuri uh, Gagarin, and he was orbiting the Earth, uh, and uh, so she played the uh, video for us, the movie for us, and in this movie... Uh, we saw uh, a secretary general uh, of Communist Party speaking to uh, uh, this uh, cosmonaut on the radio, and he was literally asking, uh, Mr. Gagarin, Mr. Gagarin, take a look clo carefully on what's uh, below you on the clouds. Do you see anybody in the sky? And he reported, no. I don't see anybody in the sky. So the teacher turned the, mu the, the movie off and uh, she said, you see, he is the witness that there is no one up there above the cloud. God does not exist. Do not believe in God. Well, when I tell this story to many Christians, I've told enough of it to... Uh, see that when people hear about such a, a picture of God, they kind of smile and laugh. But such a picture does have its history. So um, uh, this particular uh, painting uh, belongs to uh, a, a Renaissance painter, uh, who lived in, uh, 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 you know, who lived uh, uh, in the 15th century. Uh, his name is Sima da uh, Conegliano. And this is God the Father. And that's another one, the same period, a Renaissance painting... Uh, by Giovanni Bellini, also depicting exactly what our teacher was showing. You know, an old man with a white beard who lives up on a cloud. And look at the picture. Well, look at the title of the picture. In fact, you can uh, see this painting in one of the big cathedrals in Italy. Because all these Renaissance painters uh, put their paintings on the ceilings. Uh, and so everybody, that's why everybody goes to Italy to enjoy the 
Renaissance art. But yes, this is, this is exactly how uh, these people in the you know, end of the Middle Ages, that's the end of the Middle Ages period, they, that's how they thought God the Father looks like. And pay attention to the face of this old man. You may laugh at the depiction, but look at the face in both paintings. Can you show us the previous one? And see? This one and then the next one. And I've seen quite a few of this type of traditions. Especially this uh, father. His face is kind of grim. Don't we often think of our Heavenly Father like this? It's unfortunately the paintings are five plus hundred years old, but our thinking has not changed. Very often, many Christians think that God the Father is some kind of scary, distant, transcendent, powerful God. Oh, we better not deal with such a God. Uh, and it's easier to deal with Jesus. Jesus is a kind, loving, and compassionate God. Is this true? Well, this is what the uh, second chapter of First John is talking about. Little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. What are you thinking when you hear the word advocate or intercessor. I tell you, sometimes, I mean, very often I would say, it's hard to deal with certain institutions which uh, we have to deal with. For example, I don't know who among those who present here are watching us ever had to deal with immigration court. You better have a lawyer because you're coming in front of the judge and uh, you may mess up. Are we having the same feelings thinking about our about God the Father and Jesus taught us to pray how our Father who art in heaven and uh, are we thinking boy without Jesus we can't convince the Father is this what the advocate really means. And when we continue to read, the next verse is uh, even more interesting and sometimes difficult to understand. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not only for 
ours, but also for the whole world. Propitiation. Have you ever heard this word? You may think, is this fellow speaking in English? Well, I took it exactly from New King James Bible. Uh, I, maybe someone who knows English uh, better than me can, uh, can uh, correct me, but I don't think this word is used outside of the Bible. Do you know any? Well, so let's see the definition of this term propitiation. Go back. We need that slide. So these are the two definitions that I found. Propitiation. The action of propitiating or appeasing a God, spirit, or a person. What? Is Jesus an appeaser of the Father for us? Uh, once my good friend, an evangelical missionary whom I met back in Ukraine, told me. Uh, he was explaining to me uh, why Jesus died on the cross. And so his explanation was like this. You see, God is very uh, angry at sin. And so he is so angry, but he loves the sinner. So he doesn't want to hurt the sinner, but that's why he lashed out his wrath on Jesus. Whoa. In such an explanation, we have an even bigger problem because uh, we have a father. God is presented as a father with an anger issue. I don't know. Sometimes we grew up with, uh, in a families with a father like that who had an anger issues. And every time we being bad, the belt or whatever kind of weeping device is taken and we experience pain as a result of his anger. So... I looked at different translations and I searched about 20 different English Bibles and I see two words used about to translate uh, John chapter 2 verse uh, uh, 2 and it translates as Propitiation or atoning sacrifice? Oh, it's New International. And I heard many people say, and I agree with them, that New International, the English of New International Bible is much easier. Am I correct? So, in New International, they're talking about atoning sacrifice atonement what is atonement can you tell me again are you using this word in your conversations outside of the bible reading you see this is the problem the problem is that many preachers and theologians cannot make a sense out of these Words that sound English, but who knows what they mean? Propitiation, atonement, and you try to Google 
Well, one idea, let's see if you can pull the text. Can you click again? Oh, it's not go. Okay. Go back to up, up. Okay, one uh, suggestions that some of the preachers proposed break down the word atonement into three words, at one man. So what? So Jesus is our at one man sacrifice. Do you understand any better? I don't think so. So if you Google the word atonement, you will see this. In religious contexts, it means reparation or expiation for sin. Reparation, expiation, even more confusing, isn't it? In Christian theology, reconciliation of God and humankind through Jesus. Nice, but what does it mean? It's like, are we at war with the Father and at peace with Jesus? And Jesus is supposed to reconcile us with the Father? The big question here, who is Jesus then? Is he God? If he is, then how many gods do we believe? You see how confusing all these definitions are. So, let's do next. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, I did a little research. Uh, I took the word profi- pro- propitiation, and I discovered that it's in Greek means hilasmos. And I began to search for the Greek translation of the uh, Old Testament, known as Septuagint. Uh, And I found a very interesting text. It says here, the Lord spoke to Moses. This is Numbers chapter 5, verse 5. The Lord spoke to Moses Speak to the children of Israel. When a man or a woman commits any sin that man commit in unfaithfulness against the Lord, and the person is guilty, now this is what should be done. Then he shall confess the sin which he has committed. He shall make a restitution for his trespass in full, plus one-fifth of it, and give it to one he, to the one he was wrong. But if a man has no relative whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution for wrong must go to the Lord for the priest. In addition to the ram of the atonement, with which atonement is made for him. So look at this. So when somebody did wrong to someone, and it uh, involves maybe an insult or uh, destruction of the property, whatever, three things which is which the one who is guilty is supposed to do. Number one, confess. That's what we read in 1 John chapter uh, uh, 1, verse 8, which says, uh, if we, chapter 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
So, uh, it's basically, that's the first step to make it right. Confessing and receiving forgiveness. And then, of course, if something is wrong done, then you try to make up for it. Pay restitution. Seems to be all right. But not quite. Then, besides the restitution and confession, the Bible says there needs to be an atonement. So what is the atonement? Uh, this is the key biblical concept, which in order to be understood properly, we need to study it in the uh, books of Moses, because that's when this concept first appears. This is the verse that, which explains what the atonement actually is. Uh, the story is about two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Avihu, who came to uh, the sanctuary with the foreign fire, and they were... Uh, and God took their lives. And so after that, the rest of the, after this event, the rest of the priests uh, got scared. So Moses goes to the sanctuary. He sees that priests are not doing their duties and acting correctly with uh, sacrifices. And he says, to them, why have not you eaten the sin offering in a holy place? What does it mean? When we look at the Leviticus chapter 6, we see what God requires for the priest to do when he helps the sinner to bring his sin offering. First, what the sinner does, the sinner needs to lay his hands upon the head of the animal, and the animal is to be slaughtered, and the animal's blood is to be presented to the horns of the altar. But then, the meat of this sheep or goat is to be taken inside the sanctuary at the uh, inner court. There they had a big cauldrons full of boiling water. And this meat was to be boiled in this water, cooked like this, with no seasoning, with no salt, just boiled in a plain water, and after that, the priest who uh, was, uh, and his family, was supposed to eat this meat. Can you imagine what it feels? I don't know if you have ever eaten a boiled lamb or a boiled goat meat. That doesn't sound appealing. With even no salt. I'm not even talking about any kind of seasoning. So... Why did they have to do such a ritual? Moses here explains. So, why haven't you eaten the sin offering in the holy place since it is the most holy? Very interesting here. Most holy. So that boiled meat of the goat is called the most holy. It sounds really, really strange, isn't it? But, Moses continues, and God has given it to you, and now look, 
There are two lines here, and each line explain, you know, is basically uh, explains the same thing. So these two lines, they explain the same thing in different words. So here it says, to bear the guilt of the congregation. So basically, this is why uh, in the sanctuary service, God commanded the priests to, quote, unquote, enjoy eating the meat boiled in the water with no seasoning. It's to bear somebody else's guilt, to carry somebody else's guilt. And then Moses repeats, and, it's, and Moses says, to make atonement for them before the Lord. So you see what the atonement is? It's not the restitution, as uh, the dictionary says. It's not even reconciliation. It's a process of bearing someone's guilt or sin. What does it mean? Well, think about it. Something is burdening you. This is something which we humans, we're designed like this by God. We, it's very hard to carry a burden inside us. We need to share. Sometimes it's called unloading. A different People, different personalities, extroverted personalities will unload by just being very emotional in front of ev any, everybody sometimes, but even a very introverted personality really needs unloading, but the introvert is going to look for someone whom he or she really trusts, right? So, but we need, if something is inside of us uh, being the burden, we need to unload. We need someone to, to hear us, to listen to us. Sometimes people come with their troubles, and often we, as believers, do not really know how to help, and we avoid uh, people. For example, somebody has a grief, and I noticed that some people, Christians, believers, they behave incorrectly. Uh, they see a person with grief. They try to, uh, who is grieving and even crying, and they try to avoid this person. But this person needs the opposite. You can't help. You're not God. But if you give this person an ear to listen, this is going to help a lot. Very often after people, uh, a, a person uh, goes through this grieving period, he or she will come to those who listened and thank, because this is the way how this inner trauma is processed. This is, I'm speaking in today's terms, and people who are dealing with counseling and psychology, they can tell even more than I'm telling you. But in those ancient times, with these ancient people, they, they didn't have the level of language and terminology that we have today. And so to demonstrate the need to unload, God made this ritual of a priest 
eating the meat of the sin offering and telling the sinner that your sin, your guilt, that which burdened you is not on you anymore. I am carrying your load. Do you see what Jesus does for us? Jesus is not trying to appease the angry father who, if it wasn't for Jesus' intersection, would just smash us. We believe in one God. Yes, sometimes it's very hard to understand how come Jesus is here, he is a high priest, God the Father is here. So it's, it's difficult, but we have to remember, our God is one. So it's not possible that Jesus is uh, able to do something different than the Father is intending to do. So why the advocate? You see, this is interesting. I did a little word study of the uh, word parakletos, which is uh, used here, the Greek word, word parakletos, which is used here in uh, the text of John chapter 1, uh, 2 verse 1. And I discovered that in the same gospel, the same word is used to, as, is translated as the comforter. But when we often think of the comforter, we think of the Holy Spirit. Just remember, there's no three gods. There's no three God. God manifests himself three different ways, but there is no three God. It's one God. So Jesus is our comforter. This is what the process, I, I don't know, this, this is probably uh, the best picture which uh, I found to describe the real meaning of atonement. Forget about old cliches. Think biblically. And biblically, this is what the atonement is all about. We receive the atonement when we cry on Jesus' shoulder. And he's able to take us into his arms. And he is able to hold us steady. And he is able to comfort. And we feel safe in the arms of Jesus. Jesus' role is not to protect us from the angry father. Jesus' role uh, is to give us a loving supporting hug so that we could cry and unload our burden of guilt and sin on him who is our Redeemer, our Lamb of God, and our great Comforter. Basically, when we read John, 1 John chapter 1 and 2, we see a very important, coherent picture of who God is. Yes, we're sinners, says John, 1 John 1, 8. And yes, we need to confess. But we need to be cleansed. And so, yes, uh, John says, I don't want you to sin. I don't want you to sin. God doesn't want us to sin. But what if it happens? 
think of atonement as your perfect, most reliable insurance. That's what atonement is all about. When we sinned, when we sin, do not run away from God. Run to Jesus. He's not going to reject you. Run to Jesus with your tears, with your sorrows, with your troubles. He is going to give you a warm, loving hug. Cry on his shoulder, and he will support. He will make you whole. He will restore your soul. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, please, we so need you. We need you in our struggles, in our temptations, in our burdens. We need you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.